Hey Ethan, how are you? Tell me about yourself and how are you doing and what about your research and all? Hey, so my name is Ethan, as Hinge has already mentioned, and my research, so I'm a PhD student at Purdue University, and my current research up to now has been mainly focused on the optimization of electrolytes to allow uh, lithium-ion batteries to operate at extreme low temperatures, lower than negative 40 degrees Celsius, all the way up to negative 100, and further testing is being done to try to increase that limit past that point. Oh, so, like I have seen, like when I go somewhere, if there's too hot weather or too cold weather, battery stops working. Why battery mm -hmm. stops working when it's too low? So some of it, like for too low, um, there's like a few different reasons. There's one just like inherent limit of like kinetics get slowed down, right? As temperature decreases. So all your reactions and different processes that occur have rate kinetics associated with them. So that's inherently going to become more sluggish at low temperatures. But also one of the facts is the electrolyte itself, like the commercial electrolyte we have in our laptops, our phones, all mm. of that usually freeze like at negative 35 to negative 40 degrees Celsius. They just are frozen like ice. So okay. at that point, there's no way for the lithium ions to shuttle across the battery. Um, okay, you mean to say the mobility of ions traveling through electrolytes get hampered or damped out as the temperature goes down. Yeah, that's like a good way, I guess, to think about it. Um, okay. So that's like an overall thing. And then like one like hard limit is like, when does your electrolyte freeze, I guess? Because like all of the mobility, like essentially play, have a role in like how much internal resistance does your battery experience when it's doing like a charge or discharge cycle. And then like the heart limit, of course, is like when your electrolyte freezes and that's about it. There's like nothing you can do. Okay. So is this process, for example, if I keep on reducing the temperature from zero degree to minus 40 or minus 100, something like that, how yeah. is this process? Is it linear monotonically decreasing or it's like exponentially decay, something like that in the, in that process? You mean in terms of like resistances and that? Yeah, resistances and all. Definitely not linear. <laughs> okay, That's okay. one of the biggest problems actually we face. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's an exponential. So mm -hmm. a lot of these like, for example, like activation energies for like charge transfer from like the SEI to the electrolyte and just for like diffusing through your like SEI or, mm -hmm. or um, do your like cathode electrolyte interface, both of those are actually, you can a lot of times to fit with, I don't know if you've heard like the Arrhenius relationship, okay. um, no. but the, it's an exponential type model. So okay. it gets increasingly worse at lower and lower temperatures, which is one of the major hurdles that the whole industry is trying to kind of overcome. Okay. Okay. What could be the possible application? One application I can think of what, uh, since I work on space habitat and all, I can think of that application, like yep. low temperature batteries are, uh, that, that are batteries which can go to low temperature. They are much more useful over there. What could be all possible application and what all funding agencies are involved in these kind of scenarios? So, no, that's a good question. It is a, a pretty important question to ask, like before you do any research, right? Like hmm. what can it be useful for? Hmm. Um, for mine, there is a, definitely a lot of space application as you are well aware of. Um, hmm. And a lot of that funding comes from the government, NASA and other companies that are trying to do a lot of times with satellites. Um, but also a big focus, especially now, uh, for better or for worse, you know, um, climate change has been happening, right? Global warming. And actually what that means is the polar ice caps up north, the sea lanes are opening up. So Ooh. it's a big, um, the government and the military, especially not only the U.S., but Russia, China, they care a lot about securing the North Sea, like on the the northern ice caps. Arctic, the, Arctic Ocean, Arctic, yeah. Arctic region, I think, yeah. Yep, the Arctic region. Hmm. Um, I forget there's that term for the sea, but I think it's just that. Um, but yeah, they care a lot about securing the shipping rights and like the ships being able to sail um, safely and with protection through there. So a lot of applications now are 
thinking about how can we get our current equipment and future equipment to be able to operate in these super extremely low temperatures. So that's one area that seeing like potential applications. So a lot of government interest has come from that. Um, also just for, um, even for like EVs, for example, right? Like we say like, I want it to be able to operate let's say like up to negative a hundred degrees Celsius, hmm. but even just in, but that doesn't mean it can't operate at room temperature. It can still operate at room temperature and a little bit elevated. It just means my main focus is at low temperatures. So one of the things with even cars, right? When you try to drive an EV, at, let's say when it's in winter, negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit, your car actually needs to continuously maintain the battery pack temperature at roughly room temperature to a little bit below. So they, a lot of your battery's capacity essentially goes into maintaining a stable um, temperature for that battery pack. So if you're able to allow the battery to have more variation in temperature while still retaining its performance, you effectively are going to increase your range that you get from them, your life's time that before they need to be charged. Um, there's a lot of benefits associated with Okay, that's great. You talked about some components involved. Are these components means like uh, while you are designing your batteries mm -hmm. for those kind of components? What do you mean by components? Are there particular, you know, vehicles or something like that? The application point of view. Oh, was I'm trying to remember exactly what I said. Was that when you mentioned I was... like uh, low temperature batteries find application in components which will operate in Arctic region? What do you oh, mean? Oh, by... I I guess when I meant components, I I meant more like applications that or like technology, um, like okay. there are component in a technology that is going to be okay. utilized in that region. I okay. guess yeah. Okay, okay, that's okay. I got it. And you were talking about uh challenges related to you know when they are low temperature temperature and ev need to be you know properly heat up at the room room temperature in order mm -hmm. to provide so what could be the other application apart from i can understand means like it's much more application so one thing that hit my mind can't we have some sort of heating coils or no they will be charged again heating coils so requires electricity to be to have what could be means like other application? What could be other alternatives uh, apart from bringing those batteries to the room temperature, like to insulation and all? Is it possible? To yeah, they, they definitely insulate the battery. Like all of the EVs have like a thermal management system along with a, a battery pack management system that monitors like pack voltages, individual cell voltages, hmm. trying to like preemptively like manage and distribute like where it draws the current to because mm. um, a lot of the heating light comes from essentially um, as you're trying to charge or discharge the battery the battery warms up just inherently Ooh. so they like the battery systems in there are trying to manage like you you have like heating and cooling elements to that that mm. try to manage it that way and then you have more of a electrical element that tries to monitor like your overall, like at each pack and cell, uh, hmm. what's the state of charge? What's the voltages on these? So it's trying to equalize that. So you don't have um, essentially individual cells or packs that have spikes in the voltage. Uh, okay. And or like temperatures essentially, because if you have an over discharge or charge, um, hmm. And it heats up too much, you can lead to, of course, the battery thermal runaway, which is just hmm. a fire. That so, can kind of, yeah. If you see, even in the inter IC engines, internal combustion engine, when mm -hmm. there is too low temperature, you need to like, like you need to o open your choke or something like that, you know, to heat up initial because that also petrol also cools down. Mm -hmm. So, but later on, when it starts, it starts to means like use that heat again to to utilize that similarly yeah, so happens in uh, maybe the thing you were mentioning about giving the thermal energy to the to start the electric vehicle which will be much more than later on because battery keeps on heating up and it can utilize that energy later on to bring so it guess, uh, to the room temperature so i guess there's a few different things like um 
definitely heat recap so in use is applied uh, so like usually there's um, sensors and thermal couplers in these battery packs right they're embedded into it so they can monitor temperatures across yeah. the pack uh, so it just like how much energy is spent for heating or cooling systems around it so like when the battery is warming up, you say it's winter, right? Um, due to just the charge resistive heating, right? As you're trying to pass a current through material, it's going to heat up. Um, and along with the other associated battery sides of it, um, like, yeah, it does heat up and they do take advantage of that a little bit. But one of the differences with a lot of other technology that we've used to say like internal combustion, if it heats up too much, there's not too much of a risk of something crazy and um, major happening, you know, at worst, your engine could catch on fire, but that's a lot harder to do. Mm. But for a battery pack, if one of those cells catches on fire and it heats up past its safe temperature and it initiates that thermal runaway, we mm. don't have a good method to really control that. And the battery packs are encased usually in the frame or underneath. So they're hard to get to. So by the time you could get to it, most likely a whole battery packs in fire. And you've probably seen videos of these and it, it's just a mass fireball that's almost out of control. There's definitely companies that have research into like, how can we more effectively either preemptively control it? So like predict when it's going to happen and stop it versus like what methods can we use when it's already started to stop it? But it's still, I wouldn't say it's perfected. There's still a lot of work to be done with that. So one of the major things now is like most applications, I, I hear this actually a lot from the government that they really care about safety. Like safety is the number one thing because I was talking with one of the people in like their agency and they said they used, they were funding previously a project that was using lithium ion batteries in one of their specific applications or technologies. And when they were doing more of the trial demos, when they, scale up so there's like something called the technology readiness level yeah and when TRL. they were yeah TRL. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they were trying to get into that more prototype phase and implementation into our actual their proposed technology it actually caught on fire when they were charging and mm -hmm. at that point they told me that they pretty much just shelved they saw if those they looked into if there was an easy way to fix that and since it's for them they really care about fast charging and there was an inherent problem with that specific battery chemistry, they kind of just solved the project. Um, so like, okay. I think it's becoming increasingly significant for a lot of the industry to care a lot more about the safety aspect mm. of it. Cause up to now we've been definitely caring about the safety, but I think in a lot of ways more caring about the performance because people have always questioned like, is it even applicable? I guess to say for EVs, right? You can drive, hundreds of miles in a tank of gas if you have a fuel efficient car. But EVs, the range is limited. So a lot of people yeah. are questioning, is it even worth it? So they've been a lot of push to try to increase their performance. And now that they're starting to see, you know, better performance, better mileage, or better, I guess, miles before they got a recharge. Now they're starting to think about, okay, we really need to consider about the safety and make sure this is like, hammered down that this is a safe technology that anyone, you know, can use and they shouldn't be worried about. That's true. That's true. Means like some time back, I remember during international flights as well as national flights in India, you can't take a particular kind of mobile phone. One of them was Samsung, Samsung. because there was like uh, cases of even one plus, you know, these flown uh, means like fl phones were like blasting means like, uh, I don't know out of nowhere they were blasting so i think that may be one of the factor which you mentioned security and safety concerns are very important one thing which you were discussing previously about charging and discharging i was curious yeah. about what are these charging and discharging are the charging rate and discharging rate similar or what means like if you want to charge a battery because these time you you can see some fast charging technologies are there my mobile has fast charging but it heats up pretty quickly it means like when i yeah. doing fast charging what are all these things so i guess like the charging right um it's just there's something like in the battery industry called like a c rate um essentially just charging rate so one c is 
um, they calculate by the um, total amount of, you say, milliamp hours in your battery. Hmm. So determined by that overall um, energy of your battery, hmm. they will say, I want this battery to charge a discharge in one hour. And the current needed to do that is what we consider 1C. Okay, okay. So that milliamp hour, right? So like essentially whatever the capacity of your battery is in the milliamp hours, then that's just the current rate you need to get it to do in one hour. And okay. then you just can determine that like C over 10 means it's in 10 hours and then 2C means it's in 30 minutes, like so on. Um, okay. So one of the things like fast charging, right? How they actually work is it's more of a aspect of, it's a not, it's a little oversimplified to think of it, but it's a modified way of like a CC uh, CV charging rate where it's like constant current, constant voltage. Okay. Well, what they do is they apply a very high current to get your battery up to, let's say like 50, 60% charge. And that happens really quickly, right? And your phone overheats because as you're trying to pass current through there, um, you're trying to pass the electrons as fast as possible. And then current, like in a typical battery, there's several different steps along the way. So you have like in your anode, you say like, I guess for specifically for charging, I walk mm. over that. So like when you're trying to charge, right? You're going from the cathode to the anode, trying to yeah. remove, put that lithium ion back in it. So one of the things that happens is you have to oxidize the lithium. That lithium then has to diffuse through your cathode, whatever type of cathode it is, um, to your CEI. Hmm. Go over, because it's a solid, solid boundary. So there's a technically a little bit of phase transfer. You got to okay. diffuse through the CEI. And then once okay. you get to the boundary, so like there's overall, there's like eight or nine crit critical steps for a battery. And each of those have like the rate kinetics associated. So like when you see the heating, what's happening is one of those steps is essentially the rate limiting step. And the lithium ions are getting like stopped at that step and they're not able to pass through. It's like choke. It's like a bottleneck in the process. Okay, okay. So when that happens, right, um, you have a lot of heat that's released due to either like resistive current, like the current being passed through something. You have that releases heat. You have some of the um, just ions themselves, the movement, the thermal motion kind of dissipates some heat. And then some of the reactions actually also produce heat. So like there's a few yeah. different aspects to that, but um, I guess going back to the C rate. So they initially probably super high current that charges your phone up to just say 50, 60%. And then if you try to keep that same current, your battery is actually maxed out on its voltage. Like if okay. you were to like look at the batteries packs voltage, usually they set a voltage window that's a safe operation window. You don't hmm. want to overcharge it past that voltage because then side reactions can occur. And then mm -hmm. you have issues um, like either battery thermal runaway, like hmm. cell degradation, there's a variety of them. But so what they have to do then is they have to lower the current. And then the voltage now like drops a little bit because um, you're allowing the battery to charge at a slightly slower rate. So your internal resistances are a little lower. Okay. And then they keep doing that until like you get to the fully um, like charged state of your phone. So the reason why like they're able to charge it so quickly up to percent is they can put in a lot of current, but after some point it's like maxed out on its voltage. So they have to allow the current to slowly drop away so that the battery can continue to charge safely. But I think there'll be adverse effect onto the life of the battery pack in the, in the overall scenario. Yes, it definitely does. Um, depending on the charging protocols and how I would want to say harsh they are, um, like how fast you try to charge it depends essentially like how long of a lifespan your battery pack is going to have. So that's why they say like allowing your phone to slowly charge overnight is sometimes a good idea because um, every time you're trying to do a quick charge, you're you're trying to charge your phone into a state that's almost at the edge of like its equilibrium, right? You're trying to push that equilibrium further to get it to happen quicker. But a lot of times it doesn't really want to do that. 
So that's okay. why it heats up. That's why you see increases in the resistances. And that's why also you know, sometimes have side reactions because you're trying to push these lithium cations so quick that sometimes they don't go down the proper, you say, route through the battery that you want from an like anode to cathode. Sometimes they have a side reaction. Sometimes they get plated on the anode. There's like a variety of stuff. Mm -hmm. But so yeah, the, the, usually the faster you do it, the more likelihood it's like a probability game that you have for some adverse reaction or uh, step to occur. Mm -hmm. One more thing means like uh, I came to know this amazing fact that mm -hmm. the lifetime why the bad. Why there is a lifetime to a battery? Why is not an infinite phenomena when it's like depositing and removing the ions from like doing this, depositing the ion from one place to another place? Why the lifetime is not like okay. infinite? Why there is a definite lifetime for a battery? I wish we could have an indefinite battery. Man, if someone could come up with that, they'd be one of the richest people in the world. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, honestly, it just has to do with um, like you've probably heard all the phrase of efficiencies and all that, but it really comes down to no process is like perfectly reversible. Okay. Um, you always like, even when you look back at like, like more thermodynamics or just any, think of any process actually, um, nothing's really a hundred percent. You can get really, really close to a hundred percent, but you mm. can never fully achieve it. Um, it's just because if you try to have something that's fully reversible, usually um, it's just either entropically wise or thermodynamically or kinetically, there's some issue. But for batteries specifically, I guess I'll get back to them. Um, the main reason why you don't have an indefinite battery is the fact that during the charge or discharge process, because there's so many steps involved, there's a lot of places for that lithium cation to not do what it should do. Okay. Uh, and so, for example, when I mentioned like plating, right? So that's when like the lithium, instead of going back into the anode, like for graphite, like intercalating back into the anode, it instead plates a solid lithium on the graphite surface. Oh. And then like, even when you form like, um, when you form the SEI, for example, right? The SEI mm. is like an inherent thing that it needs for most of these battery chemistries, especially for graphite, because um, your battery chemistry as is, they try to design it to have as wide of a voltage window as possible because your essentially power density, right, is your, um, like, what's the voltage window times by the current rate you can get from it? So that's yes, like yes. Uh, okay. the watts. And like, so you want to increase your voltage window and you want to increase your capacity. Those two things, both they care about. So mm -hmm. the issue then is when a typical, like in a foam battery, the graphite's not stable in your electrolyte. Okay. If you just had it sitting in your electrolyte and you apply current, it's going to immediately react. So the okay. SDI is there to form actually like an insulating layer between the two. So it mm. reacts once and it doesn't continue to react. Okay. That's, that's an amazing fact. You, you have mentioned like no process is reversible for, if you remember in thermodynamics, if we talk about a process to be reversible, it has to be very slow. Slow. Yes. It, it had to be very slow, quasi static in order to have that yeah. reversible thing to be activated. But I don't think we can wait for like one year to charge the battery. <laughs> no, we're way too impatient. Like that's yeah. why like you can definitely get it to be a lot more reversible. Like you said, by if you slow it down to be more hmm. quasi static. Hmm. Um, like when they do very, very slow current rates, you get pretty high efficiencies, but no hmm. one really wants to use it because it's just not enough current. Yeah. Yeah. And apart from that, apart from fast charging, I think iPhone doesn't have fast charging as of now. I don't know as such because I don't use iPhone, but other like the phone, which are used by China, they, they heats up pretty quickly. And it's like, this is about fast charging, but iPhone has this wireless charging thing. That is also pretty amazing technology. It means like they use some magnetic field and something like that. What is all about wireless charging and all? Wireless is pretty. It's pretty amazing, I have to say. Um, yeah. They right now, I guess the problem with that is actually like efficiencies. 
but hmm. they've definitely gotten better. Like, uh, there's that resonance, enhanced hmm. resonance for like the um, with the frequency to increase your efficiency for like the wireless. And they've actually there actually is a company I forget their name, but there's a company that has implemented. They're still in kind of like the pilot and testing out, but hmm. I think they have sold a few models where they can change your car itself, like the EVs, hmm. to allow for your EV itself to be wirelessly charged. Oh, yeah. So there is actually a companies that do it. One particularly, um, I was reading about them and was watching one of the videos from the CEO and the technicians hmm. about it. This was a few months back. Um, hmm. But how it worked is you actually they install a set of coils right on the underside of the the car, hmm. and that's paired then with like in your garage or wherever you want to set this up. There's another set of coils. It works very similar similarly to your wireless charging for like a me, phone. Me. Okay, okay. But the main difference is that one of the problems with wireless right is the air gap. Hmm. You can try to improve that with um, tuning it to the certain frequency right. Um, to have the resonating, oh. uh, so it's kind of amplitude, essentially how much current's being passed through it. But even hmm. that has um, limitations. So a lot of they've just been slowly and slowly getting better at that. Hmm. And with the car, I forget the exact numbers, but it was pretty impressive. Uh, and but one of the things they had to do was they had to install um, a corrective way to have cameras underneath to see where you are and then line oh. up both the car and the, mm. the undercarriage of the car to the plate where the mm. coils were to line mm. them up properly. Otherwise, okay. it wouldn't be able to effectively charge. Uh, I think the concept is related to the transformer, which we study in like high school and something like that. Two coils, they have to be like, you pass a current, there is a magnetic field linking, which produces current in another one, another one. And then you can extract out that electricity. But uh, we generally, I don't know what permeability or permittivity, something like that. There should be a good magnetic core between them in order to have a better linking. But since there is an air, so there will be definitely be some losses and all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And yeah, it means like wireless charging right now, I can see means like, takes uh i would say there is a loss of energy in some or other ways i can see means like if it takes some amount of electricity to charge a phone battery with wireless charging it takes a bit more but i think with time it will definitely be improved <clears throat> yeah there there definitely is a lot of improvement that's happened like if you think about it wireless mm -hmm. charging really wasn't a thing for our phones and stuff even just to say five ten years ago right uh, so now it actually isn't phone. So it definitely has come a long way. And I, yeah. I think people are going to keep focusing on it because it's just so convenient. Yeah. Oh, I guess one of the things, I don't know if you know about it actually, but there's like more than just wireless charging, like the ability to charge something like remotely, right? And transmit essentially power across like distances is definitely something I see is like, being pretty big, um, especially with all the autonomous stuff. And the military is actually, you can even look online, it's nothing classified. Um, they've been working on laser transmission for power. Oh. So like, just say like using a high powered laser and charging it, say like a autonomous um, airplane or drone from hundreds of meters away. And sometimes even like they've Increasing the technology, there was something I think two or three years ago in um, Bedesta, the war bear center that was aimed at doing like a demonstration for some of the high ops to so like that they can power this um, AUV right from like 300 meters, I think it was, um, with just a laser because they essentially how it works is there's a laser and then you have a photovoltaic cell on hmm. your receptor, which would be in that case, the drone, and it's tuned to the specific wavelength of your laser. Hmm. So then that reacts, creates a current, right? And then you can use that current to recharge your battery. So like 
I guess the bottlenecks with both of those is your laser propagation as it's going through the air, right? There's dissipation, there's refraction, something gets in the way, it gets blocked. And then just the mm. photovoltaic technology. Mm. But there is actually, I guess I just wanted to mention it. There is actually work, not that I've ever worked on, but I've seen a few people talk about that they're able to transmit this, like essentially power across much farther distances and even as to say wireless charging. Oh, that's amazing because then it will remove out all the possible application of these wires hanging all around yeah. as well as, uh, for example, you have seen in aircraft days called refueling, <laughs> like you travel to some distance and then you refuel. If they will yeah. be like more autonomous kind of electrically powered, uh, I would say electrically powered aircraft and all you can directly charge them using shooting a laser gun on them. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's actually one of the big things that they were really wanting that technology for to be able to say like install it in the tanks or like um, the like off road cars and the transports so that they can just instead of having to have the drone land and plug in, they can just beam it up essentially. Kind of seems very sci fi, but uh, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, it's it's possible. It's hmm. really it's a neat technology. They. Still, I think definitely work that needs to be done before it can see mm. widespread implementation. But I, I can definitely see its application, especially mm. for certain fields. Um, yeah, means like even I would say, for example, drones. The One of the yeah. major problems with the drones is like, if you want to increase the range of the drone, you have to carry a heavy battery pack. And yes. then it reduces their you know lift capacity and all. Yep. So, and they can, in one go, they can, I don't know, means like 15 to 30 minutes is their maximum range. If you can use that laser to recharge them and then re that laser could be more autonomous, means that it may have a sense of where the drone is and it has a sense of time. After some time, it can shoot down the laser and keep charging it. That would be pretty amazing, I would say. Oh, yeah. No, they definitely have integrated in like real time tracking and, um, because like, you know, we're very good at trajectory calculations and predictions for movement and tracking. Cause you know, for the missiles, mm. um, back in the cold war era, there was a mm. lot of research that went into, um, uh, managing <clears throat> the missiles trajectory. So they had to design systems that can in real time shift in like different motors and like shift the rockets in these, in like missiles, right. To be able to aim on target. So we have oh, that yeah. technology. They're very good at it around okay. the world. Like they have the technology and they're very good at it. So they have implemented it into the laser to be able to track it right. And then you can, uh, and then you can, uh, I'll wait till the screen goes down. Yeah. Uh, then they can actually, like, just like you said, track it, transmit it. And then once it's charged, send some signal from like the drone in this case example, to have the laser shut off. So, okay. and it's, it's interesting is like the, like you mentioned before, like the plane refilling, right? Yeah. Um, that was technology, at least for like in air refilling, hmm. that was technology created while long ago. Um, and it still has some, they use it sometimes when they can't do ground refilling, but that has other issues with, I, the, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the first technology for that but it it's quite rudimentary like the first ones were they kind of saw a cable or threw one down and tried to hook it on and then have on the other end someone pull it and then attach yeah. and other ones now like they've had they've definitely gotten better at it but mm. um i have mm. always been amazed by just the skill like can you imagine the skill these pilots must have to fly that close to each other yeah. and not hit each other across. Um, that's, true, that's true. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I would say it requires a very good skill of a pilot to do that. And yeah. uh, other things like batteries are everywhere. If you, if you see right now due to climate crisis and environmental concerns, a lot of focus right now are put back onto electric vehicles. A lot of uh, even a lot of countries in Europe, I don't know about US, but a lot of countries in Europe already have decided like by 2030 or 2030 or 2025, they'll be retiring all the 
gasoline based car and they will be like no gasoline based car after a particular year and they will be like all electric vehicles and the the backbone of all electric vehicles is lithium lithium ion batteries to so tell yeah. me more about uh, how tesla uses those lithium ion batteries and give that much previously there was a like i would say people were very skeptical in 1980s or 1990s if you talk about them related to electric vehicles they used to think it will go only 10 maybe 10 km 20 km but with tesla they have revolutionized the distance like 500 km 1000 km so how it is possible with using like those battery packs and all made up of lithium <clears throat> so i guess there's a few problems i i guess i'll just this one right now then maybe talk a little bit what i think about some of the complete changing to evs Mm-hmm. Uh, but at least just for increasing the range right a lot of that has like tesla has been really innovative in i would say like the battery chemistry and technology is definitely good mm-hmm. um and it's very reliable I, i wouldn't say it's like the most groundbreaking but they they know they really know how to take a battery chemistry tune it to it works pretty ideally for the system and then do a lot of engineering modifications to the system to increase its efficiencies, decrease its weight. So like for example, one of Tesla's latest things they came out with was that tablet battery, right? Hmm, um, hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I can yeah, I heard that in the news. And the tablet battery is actually like it's a very simple idea, but it's a really brilliant idea where okay. instead of having to solder on this hmm. little tab like for mm-hmm. the new 4680 batteries that have like the tablets um the they were able to make the battery wider essentially and taller because mm-hmm. the coin is more evenly distributed across all your electrodes okay, okay okay because previously for each of these sheets right like an electrode sheet is just this um some atom material right your cathode or anode that's coated on either aluminum or copper respectively Mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that whole thing is then like in a in a cylindrical cell wound up in like a jelly roll okay, and then at okay. the top of all of these things when they're wound up mm-hmm. there's a little usually aluminum tab that's welded on to your current collector that then is attached to your battery positive cap and then negative cap for the anode right okay but because they're like these tiny little tabs is one on each kind of like layer you the coin is kind of localized at that little like area right oh, okay, so then the okay. coin has to spread out all through the sheet and then down hmm. so it creates a the localized high coin densities when it gets kind of funneled essentially not only causes for increase in the temperature because you have localized hot spots now because do that resistive heating but also your coin isn't effectively transferred evenly distributed through that battery So that's actually increases your probability for your say dendrites for lot, like lower columbic efficiencies per cycle. Um so all they did was they just took the regular sheet and they just took little snippets of that um coin collector and then they folded them all down to form like that top view that you see and they just attached it to the cap. So it's a very simple idea like engineering solution but it made mm. a really big difference and like by being able to make the batteries wider your packing density essentially mm-hmm. is a lot better so that's why they're able to claim this a lot higher you know like rains like energy and power yeah not, yeah not even the- uh, that that's the amazing thing even they have right now the batteries are pretty cooled down as compared to previously means like because yeah. as you mentioned due to localized a localized thing they are able to reduce the you know thermal usage you know uh, heating heating effect and all and they have increased the range and it it charges faster even there is a faster charging right now with them yeah yeah cuz they they've just like decreased or really dropped down one of the limiting steps hmm. Excuse me, right so like hmm. by being able to distribute that current evenly or more homogeneously hmm. across it Hmm. they definitely can increase your charging rate because it's like more effectively getting that current throughout the battery okay okay that's amazing 
And I think uh, related to EV technology, there are other progresses in all the countries. I think sooner, sooner or later, in 10 years from now, when you'll be having your children's, they, they maybe like when they grow up, they'll be using EVs only. And they'll be like totally ban on at least uh, on a car level, on the transportation level, at least on the transportation level, they will be like electrific el- electrification, definitely like in coming years. So like, I think it will probably eventually happen, uh, but I don't see us fully getting away of combustion just because it's very hard. Even Tesla's tried to make in other companies for like, uh, large tractor trailers and semis right and it just hasn't been too successful because it's either way too heavy yeah. and it decreases the payload they can carry it's just way too expensive and not efficient try yeah. to charge these battery packs so like for large scale transportation not of people but goods i don't see currently it's yeah. switching from combustion for like consumer and like individual transportation um yeah. I definitely see it switching, but one of the things I'm a little concerned about is the fact that um, when we, if we fully electrify, right, that mm-hmm. energy has to come from somewhere. So how is it being produced? So like, even if we get rid of all the combustion engines on the road, like, let alone the problem of like, do we have enough lithium? You know, now that we've found like the one in California, we probably do maybe, but that's still it's not a renewable resource, same as fossil fuels, right? So like, I, I think some of the key issues I, I feel at least is that where is the energy coming from? How is it being produced? If we fully electrify, then that has to be more renewable. Otherwise you're just changing where the carbon's being produced. Um, with a, with a, with a efficiency loss. If like you are using combustion engine, you'll be using one liter of gasoline to produce some kilometer of drive. But if you are mm-hmm. using electric technology to convert that gasoline energy in, in, into electric vehicle, then there'll be an efficiency loss. Definitely conversion of energy from uh, gasoline to electric and then electric to like your mechanical energy, there'll be like an yeah. uh, efficiency loss. And again, you'll be like using the non-renewable resources and it will be like even bad. Yeah, for the environment. one of the things I never realized either until I was actually doing a internship working under someone who used to be a electrical engineer at like one set, like a power plant in some at some other places. But he was telling me that there are actually like how we transmit electricity through our mm. transmission and distribution lines is very mm. inefficient. Like on average, we use lose probably about half of all the energy we produce by the time it gets to us. So like if we do transition from like now uh, fossil fuels to now being produced in a factory, or like not a factory, but a power plant, right? Like whether that be nuclear, whether that be coal, hopefully not, whether that be some other technology, right? Like however it's produced, those efficiencies along with the losses in the line, I think Mm. need to be considered. like combustion itself isn't super efficient. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying combustion is very efficient. It's not even with like yeah. combined heat capsules. It's mm. just thermodynamically not going to be super efficient. Uh, I think, what is it? I think even now the best is, is it around 40%, I think. Like yes. yes. Like Gas seven. turbines are the one which is, which are more efficient, but IC engines are like 40% efficient. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I think it's a good thing eventually to transition away from that. But Mm. I think we just need to make sure we're aware of all like the other problems that can occur when we do that switch, which Mm. a lot of people haven't really talked about too much. Like, Mm. you know, how do, how are we going to produce this increased demand electricity? That's one aspect. How are we going to store and transport it? That's another. Mm. And then like, the losses along that process, hopefully they're accounted for and there's, you know, efforts to decrease those. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's amazing thing. Means like these need, things need to be taken care of. Definitely means like when you, 
transport electricity via wires there is a lot of energy loss in the form of yeah. heat and what not but the other factors which i would say lithium reserves are also if everybody right now who are using car shifts to ev shifts to ev yeah is there sufficient lithium available on the earth crust or for example even it is available on the earth crust do we have sufficient players internationally to produce at least lithium batteries or not that is also a challenge so there is a already yeah. bottleneck at the core layer i would say at the fundamental layer production of lithium is not that faster i don't know as compared yeah. to you know environmental crisis environmental crisis and in environmental depletion is much faster at least we have to take care much about i think other what do you think about recently there was a news related to there was some in california or i don't know where that is they they yep. found a, a lithium reserve or they'll be making a battery something like that that would be a, they will manufacture batteries over there what was that yep. so they um it's actually in like one of the i think it's the imperial valley um yeah i see i see now it's the lithium valley i think they're trying to call it. but anyway like it's a pretty large reserve which is good for the us because how mm. it's coming is before they used to use like the geothermal vents to power some of their steam turbines to produce electricity mm. and just for heating and stuff mm. and then they would pump that essentially like um slowly right back mm. into the ground and then i guess mm. i'm not exactly sure who discovered it but they found that it was rich in lithium So now there's efforts in extracting that lithium from the slurry and then making it into like a lithium usually chloride solution that and then sending that slurry back underneath the ground. Um mm. and they I think the estimates were a pretty large amount and what they would be able to produce by like 2025 but whenever they give those estimates you always have to be a little cautious of um the time estimates. So but even if you say it it take closer to 2030 30, there should be a large amount but like one of the things i've always been a little doubtful about evs you even mentioned it right like do we have enough lithium um and that's something i'm a little doubtful of just because of the fact that like right now there's i think close to 1.5 billion cars in the world right uh if you think about just the population i think i saw that statistics somewhere i think it's a little under 1.5 billion And no population of the world is around 7 8 billion no, i think okay. car cars, car no, or is like 1.5 billion okay yeah okay. i'm not population i know is not 1.5 yeah. but the cars i think is around there um cuz it like the dens- the density of like car ownership is not uniform across the world right but i think like when they Do you know in have- us you have more cars than the population Yeah, we're really weird that like US for some reason they just it was this thing I guess probably like 50 60 years ago where it was like you know since the US is so big everyone's like oh we need to get a car ourselves and be able to drive around and be controllers of our own destiny. Mm-hmm. Um but now I think like you said we just have too many. There's a lot in the yeah. junkyards, some that just get abandoned on the sides of roads. So yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> we probably have way too many. Um yeah. But like if yep. we were to transition all of those cars into like EVs, right? That's mm. a lot of lithium that's required. Yeah. Uh, that's true. That's true. And uh recently in India also, like they are two different places where they found a huge amount of I think right now yeah. the market uh, lithium I means like producing lithium ores or is controlled by China, Australia, or maybe China and uh, China. some South American nations. but recently yeah. since us found one they will be in the top 5 in terms of lithium reserves recently india also found huge amount of lithium reserve they will be like in the top 7 so like i think with more digging they may find out something but uh, there are other issues also related to <clears throat> purification and all these issues remains the same but what could be the other alternatives of using if we are dropping lithium or there is a limited supply of lithium there are other things also which i was hearing sodium ion batteries aluminum ion what are all these means are they are they just spe- speculations or they are really a good deal 
Yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, like, I guess, let me touch on the lithium reserves and I'll go into like the different alternatives, like you just said. Hmm. I, hmm. I, I definitely think like as we, you know, we haven't fully explored the whole world, right? So we're going to keep discovering some more and more. But there's like an inherent problem with all of this. We've had it with fossil fuels and now we're having it with lithium. Um, we have been really bad at recycling for a very long time. And like anything we use, right, is a non-renewable. It can be renewable if we recycle properly because it's not like it's getting consumed. It's just converting to different forms and it's harder to extract. But we there's so many small phones, appliances, and other laptops and stuff over the decades that have just gotten thrown into landfills and all that, like essentially metals and battery materials just go into waste. And even now it just accumulates. So I think if whether or not we have enough lithium is a problem, but one of the biggest problems I think is we really need to improve on like uh supply chain of that end of life cycle of trying to recycle it and put it back in. Um, and that's just something like, I think a lot of it has to do with the companies and the government itself, because it's not cheap to do it. And even though some, you know, claim they can make a profit off of it, it's not as profitable as just producing this battery or technology and selling it. They make a lot of profit off that, but the profit margins on recycling are usually either negative or slim, and they also require government incentives. So like one of the problems is all these companies, they make appliances and stuff and technology, computers, laptops, phones, all this, but they don't, they're not responsible for the end of lifetime. When that battery mm. goes, Yes. Bad, right? Yeah, yeah their, yeah. their hands have been wiped clean from it. It's not their problem anymore. Um, yeah, that's true. They've made a profit, but then they've not required any responsibility. So, like, mm. I don't see the maybe this is a little radical, but I just don't see the recycling industry having lot significant impacts until there's change in how kind of the industry and how it works currently, the market. Like mm. if the companies that produce them were somewhat responsible for at least either funding or paying some amount to make so that what they produced is responsibly recycled in the end, I think that would go a long way for incentivizing and trying to improve this. Mm. Um, and I'm sure there's other solutions too. That's just one idea. But I just think something needs to be done about that. Um, yes. That's but, true. That's true. But I guess I Oh, they sorry. are the one who has who are getting huge amount of profits. They yes. should be the they should be the one who should be responsible for even if you see semiconductor industry, like how many appliances are a regular person. If you see how many uh, digital appliances every person uses every day, I think in on an average in first world countries it will be more than ten. Okay, from your mobile phone, laptops, any possible thing is like driven by chip and then when they are used out you means like everybody throws them and that creates like recycling issues so they are recycling industry also has a good future but they could be technology constrained they could be policy constrained they could be like profit making constraints and all i believe yeah no that's that's very true yeah and about the alternatives you were i was mentioning about yeah i guess <laughs> let me get back to that i got a little bit off topic <laughs> it's okay. I mean, it's like it, it was on the topic. Yeah. Um, so like there definitely is alternatives and I mm. don't think there's any battery that's going to be like one size fits it all. Like one size fits all because each of them have their pros and cons, right? Mm. Like for lithium ion batteries, it has a relatively high energy density. Mm. You know, it's one of the lightest on that, like, periodic table so that's why it has very high energy density compared to like sodium or potassium yes um, yes but i think when 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 we were used to see in the nurse equation or some equation it has some electrode potential of three point something which is maximum than any any anyone on the periodic table i think yeah it, it has Medium. a pretty high like when it's paired with uh, with its like cathode right mm -hmm. it does have a pretty high potential which gives it mm -hmm. that wide voltage window Okay. Um, and you can design cathodes to have higher voltages, hmm. um, but lithium is usually a little bit more stable 
in electrolyte with high voltage than some of the other alternatives. But mm. it does have drawbacks, right? Like the runaway events. Mm. It has a limited amount of it. And then just how fast you can actually charge or discharge is actually kind of intrinsically limited. Mm -hmm. um, no yeah. matter, you can improve it, right? But there mm. is going to be a theoretical limit where once you reach that, you can't improve it. We're, we're definitely not there, but there is a limit and different other battery chemistries have an intrinsically higher limit. Mm -hmm. So for certain applications, I can see lithium being replaced, but mm. one of the problems okay. when you try to introduce any type of technology, mm. it always comes down to profit at the end of the day, right? So yeah. no company is going to produce it unless they see a profit and they see it an increased profit, not just a profit, but it has to be better. So one of the mm. problems with implementing new technologies is in the future, it could definitely have better performance in some specific field or application. But if it doesn't have it currently and the cost for production isn't currently lower, a lot of companies will be very hesitant to pick it up and start in it. And that's been one of the problems we've seen for decades. Um, and even just in the past few years with all the startups, <laughs> right? It's kind of slow to, to kind of gain ground. Um, and one of the issues, right, is lithium ion technology has actually gotten so much better than when it first came out. Um, hmm. When it first was created, right, it wasn't, didn't have too much energy density. It didn't last that long. And it was quite hmm. expensive to make. If you hmm. look at like a trend for the cost per watt hour, hmm. it's decreased hmm. like drastically. Um, and that's just to like, oh, yeah. Hmm. Go ahead. Uh, and that's just kind of due to like um, economics of scale. Hmm. That's due to like improvements in the engineering for like production line in that. And that has to happen with any new technology. So like one of the issues is you have that aspect of it that's like economic and like engineering driven where currently it hasn't been optimized. So like to get that to a point where it's optimized, it takes time and it's going to be more expensive. And then another limitation is just like, what uses is the battery chemistry actually going to be good for? Um, and like sodium ion and some of that, I can definitely see use. Like one of the problems now is it just doesn't have a long life um, term. Essentially, like how many cycles you can charge and charge discharge before it be essentially loses too much of its theoretical capacity, so you can't store much energy. Isn't hmm. too long. Oh. Um, like, but sodium is like available abundantly all around yeah. the, uh, means like in the form of salts and also abundance is huge. But as you mentioned, in terms of battery technology and all the concepts of, of charging and discharging life and all these things could be compromised on. Well, I think that's one of the problems too, is like, I can definitely see the benefit of sodium, right? It's more abundant. Uh, it has maybe more abundant. recyclable. I don't know. means like. Maybe, yeah. Um, I don't know too, too much about that. Um, hmm. How, like, the differences in recyclability between the two. Hmm. Um, but, like, sodium, I can see it be maybe being used more for, like, large grid scale applications, right? Because it's more abundant. If you need hmm. huge quantities of it, that yeah. can be a benefit. But it also has a problem of you do have some issues with its own thermal runaway events. And sodium hmm. melts at a lower temperature than lithium. Um, and it softens at a lower temperature. Okay. So, so the challenges of like uh, what you were, your research is all about like low temperature batteries, it will be more challenging for, I would say, sodium ion batteries. Yeah, th there is some results have been seen at low temperatures, but it's usually a little limited. And um, some of that also just has to do with the electro signs for um, sodium isn't as well as understood as lithium because okay. you know we've had several decades for lithium research yeah. and not nearly as mm -hmm. much for sodium so mm -hmm. like right now sodium is pretty limited in terms of like its effective anodes that they use mm -hmm. lithium mm -hmm. mainly uses graphite or some other ones sometimes mm -hmm. like lithium titanate um, mm -hmm. sometimes with a silicon additive there's like several different varieties that you can choose from but hmm. sodium, they have some, but the main one is definitely hard carbon. Um, okay. And hard carbon is just like pyrolyzed carbon precursors. Okay, um, okay, 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 okay. And it's, 
it's made so it, it doesn't like graphite has these layers right that the lithium can store in interstitially but and that only creates like an expansion for the graphite layers of i think like i think it's like 10 to 20 percent or something around there um, okay. but sodium on the other hand is several times more than that and potassium's mm. also either worse or also very bad so that's why they can't use graphite and they have to use hot carbon okay um, okay 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 i got it okay but so like the problem is like each of these battery chemistries has like some issues with them one mm. of the honestly one of the things that i don't think as many people talk about them but i i could definitely see a lot of applicability in grid scale mm. um is more of like a an alloying type of like molten salt battery um so like there's a company called ambry i think it was started by around cambridge i think mit um mm. the one of the professors um but they've actually they have actually built some largest um grid storage for like a few facilities i think because they've been around for a few years but they're one of the ones that i like i think one of the problems with a lot of these startups is they claim to be like the wonder solution for everything they're going to like change the world they're going to fix all these problems but like they have to be i think realistic on what they can achieve in like a finite time span that they can get enough investment and sell enough units right to keep making a profit and get better and better in the span um and ambry is one i think i see is like pretty good at like they they focused in on one technology they know it has some downsides but they're marketing for specific applications where the downsides on a big problem so like for those for that technology they use i think it's calcium antimony um okay. and they have like an electrolyte in between and they have to it's like an alloying type where the when the calcium is uh when it's discharged the calcium gets oxidized it gives up its electrons and then it forms an alloy with the antimony okay okay okay, and okay. it does have to be heated but the benefit for that one is it just needs an initial heating and then after it's been heated it's self-sustained so one of the things you mentioned before right like the lithium it's heating so it's like self-sustaining this yes, one it yes. actually is self-sustaining oh, so it okay. um like the heating that it occurs when you like charge or discharge it actually maintains the temperature enough that it can keep doing as long as i think you cycle or do like two four charge and discharges within a day it maintains yeah. like a constant temperature but like technologies like that that like they have a nice market and they are very good at that and like that one right because it needs to be heated there's no safety effects there's no thermal okay. runaway problems you can get pretty high um like since it's not as energy dense as lithium it doesn't need to be because it's for grid scale mm. they have a lot more space available they can mm. make large units um mm. so like i think all these technologies whether it be lithium sulfur whether it be myobium whether it be sodium mm. uh, whether it be like silicone they i think initially at least they got to find a nice market where they can really excel at okay, and then okay. use the profits in like funds from there to improve their in the production line improve their chemistries in before That's they true. can really be as competitive as the you know lithium which has been the main one and then once they are i can definitely see them taking over in certain fields but yeah i think it's like a stepwise process hmm. and companies they're never going to give up the profits they already have for some future goal they only look at like am i going to be making more profit or less yes so that's true that's true that's true means like i means like whenever you see trailers of in the uh, tra trailers of new companies who are focusing on new technologies you will by uh, seeing the trailer you will you will see wow it's amazing it could be a breakthrough but when you dig deeper then you realize okay there are some potential challenges of yeah. every technology possible there are some benefits but there are some definitely there are some challenges also so yeah um, means like definitely means like electric vehicles are the future and lithium ion and all these kind of batteries would be the future we have to be less reliant on fossil fuels and how climate crisis is you know worsening and you know a lot of countries are already underwater you know Indo indonesia's capital jakarta is already like they are changing their capital because of like <laughs> they are going underwater yeah, yeah so I, 
I saw on the news about that and hmm. I was reading a little bit and that is kind of insane to think about. <laughs> and entire, I think, atmospheric, uh, you know, dynamics is changing. As you were mentioning, Arctic region is being opening up, yeah. you know, uh, global south is being heating up. So it's like, you know, definitely ice, you know, sea level will rise and a lot of these things are happening all around the world, you know. So it's definitely, there's also a limit when they discuss, when they go into the conference on climate changes, they talk about this 1.5 degree. I don't know, there's some number above, above which if you go, you are, there's no coming back. I don't know if we reach that number or not. Or, I don't know. So like, yeah. So I guess one of the things too is like, um, like I definitely like, I guess just as a caveat, I definitely believe global warming is a big issue. Right? I like there's a lot of proof with that. Uh, there's no like in my mind, there's no way you can really deny it. But hmm. one of the things is the world, the the Earth does go through cycles. So like when they say like you can't come back from it the world itself will eventually reset itself because hmm. like, if you look through like the cycles of climate, there's, we go through phases of ice ages to warming and then back and forth. So it, it will eventually reset, but not hmm. in our lifetime and not in any generations of lifetime that we would want. So like yeah. it, if you do go too far, it's very difficult to reverse it. And I, I do think that's true, but, um, have and as you can far? see, I don't know. Even, yeah, climate changes, it's not only climate change, like, you know, some countries are, you know, you know, just submerging inside water. This, they are challenges related to climate change, related to food security also. Yeah. And when there's a food security, then they'll be like, you know, like population of humans on earth is like 8 billion, which is much more. And how to sustain with you know, when there is an impact on food security, then there'll be a chaos and all. So these things are interrelated. It's on only like uh, if somebody says every day you are smoking two cigarettes, if you go out, you know, so that is like equivalent to like that is not only the problem related to air pollution, then it will impact food security, it will impact other things and there'll be much more chaos. It's better to have much more policies like on the forefront and strict implementation of that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Hmm. It's it's an interesting, I guess, aspect to it because I... I don't know. I, I think well, there's a lot of, like you've mentioned, like confounding things that go into this. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, just, I, I think it takes like coordinated effort, like you even mentioned, right? Yeah. Like no one country person's going to solve this and like yeah. people got to come together and like agree mm. on stuff which is <clears throat> unfortunately i think always one of the hardest things <laughs> okay that was an amazing podcast with you ethan thank you for appearing on this podcast and sharing your insights on your research and future of battery technology and electrification and all and climate crisis thank you for this podcast well thank you for having me and I had definitely had a good chat and fun time. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for making it up and finding time for the podcast. It was long due, I believe. <laughs> yeah. It was a yeah. good time. You you definitely were right that this went by quick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's already one hour nine.